Uh, thank you, Amy. Um, yes, almost you called me the productive manager, which would be quite something to aspire to, I'm sure. Tēnā koutou katoa, tēnā tu mihi ki a koe Amy, uh, ki a koutou, uh, ke te mana tūtanga o e mahi ana. Ko Matthew Oliver, tōku ingoa, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. And it's uh, great to see such a large group of people here. I did not quite expect it being in the little room. Um, uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of a disclaimer. Uh, when I pitched this talk, I thought I was going to have lots and lots of answers uh, to this question that's been in my head um, about how publishing at Manitou Tanga can be a bit more, uh, make a, a bigger sort of active contribution to both government and to the cultural sector. Um, I've got a few answers, or maybe you might just call them um, ideas. Uh, but the bulk of this talk will be about the sort of things we've been learning over the last year as we've, well, the last couple of years really, as we've grappled with the idea of how to update an, encyclo an online encyclopedia. And I want to give a mihi to Martha Van Drunen, who I can see over there, maybe Jamie Mackay, who might be somewhere, um, who have done a lot of the really hard work that's led to some of the, some of the ideas in this. Um, a bit of background, uh, I work at uh, Manitou Tonga, the Ministry for Culture and Heritage in the Research and Publishing Group. Um, so we're part of a tradition of government publishing that goes back to about the 1930s uh, with war history, um, historical atlases, uh, histories of government activity, that sort of thing. Um, but my main focus over the last couple of years has been managing Tiara and NZ History. Um, they've both built up over many years. NZ History launched in 1999, uh, Tiara initially launched in 2005 and was it, it's what we call the build phase was completed in 2014. Um, without meaning to be mean, and maybe Jamie's not here so I can say it, um, NZ History does tend towards a bit of a Pākehā view of our history, um, and Tiara made a very explicit attempt to be far more bicultural in, in its approach, and it um, engaged a wānanga, um, did a lot of translation into te reo, um, and took very specific Māori perspectives um, on many subjects. I've been referring to them recently as sort of legacy or enduring content, um, and that's to distinguish them a bit from other projects that the Ministry does that are more time-bound and more sort of specifically project-based. Uh, and we've developed a new uh, a digital strategy recently, and that recognises that these sort of legacy sites are really quite central to the work that the Ministry does in public engagement. It's there to support other projects the Ministry does, and those projects are there to support um, the maintenance of, of that legacy content. Um, is this going to work? It does. And thank you to the tech people who sorted this out for me. Always good to start with a panic before a talk. Um, yeah, we've got quite a lot of content. Um, there, are some, there are some figures. Um, it's probably small in comparison to collection databases, um, but it is content that requires constant sort of updating and tending and looking after. Um, and that begs the question of where do you start? Uh, you know, do you, do you just... Um, you know, do you just keep up with the news? Do you look at sports scores, election results, census data, all those slightly annoying taxonomic discoveries that scientific, uh, scientists make about um, species? Um, so over the last year, oops, gone too far. Oh no, no, that's not. That's all right. Um, over the last year, we've been looking at the um, social connections theme in Tiara. Um, it's one of the twelve themes in Tiara, and it was launched initially in two thousand and eleven. It's heavy on st statistics, um, you know, census, health data, that sort of thing. Um, so it sort of seems like an obvious place to start for maintaining the currency of the website. Um, but it's also probably the hardest theme. And I'll, hang on. It's probably the hardest theme, given its coverage of contemporary issues at the time, which really places that material in a sort of historical, it's sort of a point in time. It's quite useful as a record, I guess, of what, what New Zealand thought was important. Or maybe what government thought was important. Yeah, so that, that's, that's a bit of a point. Um, I'm going to come back to that, that historical significance idea quite a lot later. Um, it also points to some general issues. One of them is sprawl, uh, the way that topics just spread out right across Tiara. So trying to look at one subject, you're actually dealing into multiple themes. Um, We've been looking at keywords lately. I'm not going to talk too much about keywords because it's such a simple idea, particularly in this, um, this sector. You're all doing subject headings and cataloguing and all that for Africa. So um, it, it's fairly simple, um, but it's a very obvious way that we can tie content together. Um, I guess an obvious example is 
something like places content, where we tend to have a, a places entry, we might have iwi entries that could relate to the place, we've got biographies of people that relate to the place, and then there are just all the tiny little mentions that filter out into all those subjects. Birds is another good example, we always return to birds. Uh, we have, I think it's the large forest bird entry, which appears in the bush theme. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mel, you'll remember. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then we have seabirds, which appears in the land and sea theme. So they're, they're not actually connected in any sort of meaningful way, or, or at least an obvious way. Um, and you know, keywords, we've done very well on, on NZ history through them. Um, search engines love it because it creates these keyword pages that are really rich in content. Um, and without promoting them at all, a lot of people are using them. Um, so sprawl is one issue, but then there are bigger issues. Um, and it, again, it's not a radical idea. Things change, you know, history changes. Um, but I think um, the really key thing is what we consider worth writing about changes. And you know, that, that's quite a fundamental thing. Uh, what subjects are we covering? Um, so I think we could take the Tiara article on digital media and the internet. Um, as quite a good example. It was written by Russell Brown in 2014, but even in those short three years, things have changed a lot on the internet. Um, you know, his article covers a lot of the important things that, that were quite valid, valid at the time. So it's a really useful pointer in time of what do we think about digital media and internet in 2014. But when we come to update that, how do we, how do we, how do we just update um, how do we tinker, yeah, well, when we update it, do we just tinker with it to try and give it a contemporary face? Or do we actually have to fundamentally revisit that subject and do an entirely new article? But that's kind of the decision point we have to make. Is it worth that, is that subject worth covering in the same way? Or is, it, is there something new that needs to be looked at? I think also, you know, changes in society, they also influence the way we might approach a subject. Um, you know, we're currently grappling the way with, with the way Tiara talks about sort of gender identity and the way society in general thinks and talks and accepts gender identity these days is very different to when that article or some of those articles were published in 2011. It's not that they didn't exist then um, but I guess government publishing tends to have a slightly top-down or academic approach to subjects which may not may, may not be appropriate for when you're dealing with you know particular communities. Um, you know really to represent communities and even just get the right language into those entries actually means engaging with communities in a, in a whole other way. And it may, you know, there may even be subjects where we stop and think, well, are we even the right people to, to talk about this? You know, should we just be pushing, you know, sending our audience to other areas to get that sort of information? Um, I mentioned biculturalism earlier, and I think uh, the approach to biculturalism and the treatment of a lot of Māori subjects is really quite interesting. You know, when Tiara started and how that was conceptualised. Um, I think today it has the potential to look a little bit like othering. You know, we have a Pākehā view here and a Māori view here. And, and in the context of the time that played a really, really important function because we needed to shine a light on Māori culture. It wasn't recognised in the way that I think it's being recognised now as quite a sort of integral and important part of our society. You know, everybody's culture includes Māori culture. And you can see that in the talks we've had just in the last couple of days. You know, I've heard more te reo here than any previous NDF. Um, so I think things have changed in that regard. And that sort of... What am, I, what am I thinking? You know, I mean, well, I guess what I'm wondering is what does that really mean for the structure of a website that is built on quite a distinct bicultural model when we want to bring those things back together? Um, I guess what I'm saying is that writing things down and publishing them is a, is a way of fixing things in time. In the print world, that was fine. We knew what that meant. In the digital world, we don't quite know what that means anymore. You know, what we choose to write about and the words we use, I guess the perspectives we come from are privilege all places work in a historical context. And it's very similar to the way that museums and archives and libraries make decisions about what to collect, what to discard, what to um, promote, um, you know, what to digitise, and so on. I do get a little bit hung up on this. It sort of stops me thinking, well, where, where do we go from this? You know, where do we go to from here? And sort of doubt starts to creep in. If, we, if, we, if what we wrote and how we wrote it fixes the information in that moment of time, I'm going to sound a bit like Carrie from Sex and the City. You know. <laughs> Should we change it? 
<laughs> are we somehow breaking the historical time continuum? I guess is what I'm trying to say. And even more than that, you know, if society looks at how we wrote about something 10 years ago and doesn't like it, you know, if we change that to reflect today's sensibilities, you know, are we kind of hiding the progress that we've made and, and even the darkness of our past? That is getting a little bit dark, maybe. Um, and I do just want to pass, pause long enough to acknowledge the people in the audience who did work on Teara. I can see Mel here, and Emily's at the back there. And I do want to reassure you that we are still updating Teara, and we will continue to update it. And I say that very strongly, Mel, even though why do you look suspiciously at me? Um, but we do have to do that in a more targeted approach. And I think we have to also do it in a, with a bit of a hierarchy in mind. There's going to be content that's quite easy just to keep on updating. Um, all black schools, you know. You know um, all black schools, the number of women in parliament, you know, all those sorts of things can be, can be updated quite, quite quickly. Um, but there'll be some areas where it's not quite so easy to make that decision. And we have to decide, do we, need, do we, need a, do, we do a new article? Um, or even is that subject no longer no longer relevant to today's society, and we should just let that piece of content sit as a historical record. Um, so something we are doing. Uh, we're sort of looking at topic pages as a slightly um, higher order of keyword links that we can start making. And so what we've learned from some of the audience research we've done in the last year is that people, and especially young people and people learning, um, they're looking for, for two things, credible, you know, credible, reliable information, but also they want a variety of perspectives. Um, that's quite challenging for the government. We can't just prevent, present the government view anymore, you know, um, or the government sanctioned view. Um, I mean, it's still valid, but it needs to be presented alongside other views and other voices and other perspectives. So our role in that world becomes, you know, actually starting to be active and presenting those different views and presenting our content alongside those views. And it is really what uh, Pierre was talking about yesterday, about being a node in the network, being very active as a node in the network. But developing those critical skills, skills of course, is really important. You know, this age of fake news and fake history, to, to steal Vincent O'Malley's term from, from a few weeks back. You know, we, we do need to address some of these issues that are going on in society and actually try and shape how people think about them and how they interact with the internet. So, topic pages, um, they'll include, you know, they'll be like souped up keywords, they'll include lots of information from across our <coughs> websites, um, but we also want to be linking out to other people more, we want to be drawing on the likes of Wikipedia, Digital New Zealand, um, we also want to be, you know, presenting um, historical context around some of that information that we're not updating, explaining even why we're not updating, updating it. Um, I think too, it gives us... No, what does it do for us? I, I guess the benefits for us is it provides a framework around which we can start doing some of that updating work on Tiara. What we've found from you know, picking 100 entries on social connections, it's not, it doesn't scale very well. It doesn't, it's not a logical way to approach updating uh, an online encyclopedia. If we can pick topics that are in the news, or they're trending in our analytics, or they're supporting other programs of activity that's going on either within the ministry, across government, or across the sector. We can sort of zero in on those, and potentially even get, um, get other people helping us do that updating and maintaining work at the same time. Um, that's just a little plug in case anyone else you know, wants to jump in. Um, but yeah, we have... Uh, yeah, so we can, you know, there is this idea that we can just quickly pop up a topic, you know, to support something new and, and, and keep the legacy content refreshed and updated to respond to that. And I think it might also be a way to bridge that, those different perspectives that exist within our content. You know, we can actually, I think it would be very hard to, to remodel the whole underlying structure, particularly around biculturalism, but if we can build something on top that pulls different perspectives together and says, yes, we do have this fairly Pākehā view of a place. I've only got 10 minutes left. Right, I'd better hurry up. Um, yeah, we can actually link in the iwi story, and that's a really, getting those things working together is really quite valuable. Well, it has to be done. Um, okay, so I'll start running. Um, this was the area where I hope to have lots and lots of answers, and I don't have many answers. <coughs> I, I have a few ideas to throw out there. Um, 
how can Tiara act as a platform? And I'm using Tiara as a bit of a shorthand for Tiara and NZ History and all the other legacy content that we have. Um, at a simple level, it is being that active node in the network, and I think using the uh, topic pages actually really helps with that. Um, I think it's the second way is to look at other organisations, and I'm thinking particularly of government, government organisations, who are publishing general information. Um, it's not to do with their, it's not their core business, it's not specific campaigns, but it's information they happen to be specialists in. Um, within government, something like Tiara has a far greater reach, particularly into education and into a general audience, than your, your average government department website. And no offence to anyone here who works on a government de um, department website, you're doing a great job, but I just think in that general information, we could be collaborating more around those sort of shared subject, um, subject areas. Um, I could give you a quick, well, a quick example would be working with uh, Ministry for Health on information about the 1918 flu pandemic, um, which of course has, has relevance today. It's a key part of the, the World War I story that we've been telling for the last four years, five years, uh, you can tell. Um, but you know, by placing that within the wider historical context that we have, you can get um, learning, learning, uh, you know, learning points both around history and around public health as it relates today. Um, I was going to say that longer, so it would have made more sense, but never mind. Um, other examples, you know, we, we contributed to the Hitohu exhibition. We're actually hosting all the data and biographies behind that exhibition. Um, we had for some time, so that was a good, you know, a good way for National Library and Archives to avoid having to rebuild a platform to actually host that material. So there's, there's clear synergies there. Um, Beyond government departments, we also want to work with communities. We're doing a lot of that at the moment with Iwi. Uh, at the moment, we're working with Ngati Awa to tell their uh, treaty settlement story, and that's part of the Tatai Treaty Settlement Stories project. Um, and again, that's that's about them reaching a wider audience with their story, but it's also providing us with other perspectives on treaty history um, and being able to provide those to the user. I'm also thinking about how we could be a home for legacy content. I was talking to someone recently who'd done a lot of research and writing for a to support an exhibition. All that material was published online. The author went to look for it a few years later on the museum's website, and it had gone. You know, the exhibition had closed. Uh, the content fell off the end of the long tail, and it was culled. That sort of thing. Um, it's not a one-off, we know it happens, but I wonder is it enough to take down really valuable research and then just hope the internet archive saved it and that people will find it. Uh, I think we need to really think more smarter and smartly about the life cycle of legacy content. Where should it reside long term? I mean, yes, we can turn to the National Library and Archives and say, hey, you guys could look after this. And we hope that they say yes and they have the resources to do it justice and put it into context and provide interpretation. But I'm wondering if we could take more of a sort of collective effort at keeping that sort of material alive. Um, keeping it alive and keeping it going in the context that it should exist and where it is most meaningful for users, rather than locking it away somewhere and hoping it sort of bubbles up to the surface. So, I, I, yeah, I guess it's that. No, I think I've made that point. Legacy content, yeah, it needs to have a life that's um, within context and wrapped into a, a broader cultural um, set of information. And I think something like Tiara and Inset History can provide that sort of thing. I wonder if I had another slide. No, I didn't. Um, so I guess that's my pitch, really. Um, doubts ever present, of course. You know, so maybe Tiara and Inset History aren't the places you think of um, as platforms. Um, but certainly around keywords and around topics and being that more active member of, of the digital ecosystem um, and the network is, is a direction we'll be going in. Um, I'm going to go off script now and um, I think that you know, there is clearly a big theme in this conference about collaboration. And for those of you who have been to NDFs over many years, we've talked about collaboration forever. You know. um, we used to be the young people and we were shaking our fists <laughs> at our managers and telling the organisations to be better. Well, now we're the grown-ups, you know. Um, if we can't do anything as grown-ups, we're no better than those managers we, we shook our fists at all those years ago. Um, and I think if you listen to the things that Pierre War is saying, that Minister Curran is saying, 
Collaboration is the name of the game and in the public service we've had, had that as a theory for a long time under better public services and this new administration, I'm trying not to get political at this point, um, but this new administration seems to be very focused on making sure we're getting the most out of out of, out of sort of collective, I'm not going to say impact, because apparently you don't want to say collective impact anymore, but that collective Im, um, effort and that genuine collaboration <laughs> around users' needs. And we do have shared audiences. Um, we probably have, you know, well, we have a shared audience. We have, we have a shared educational audience. We have a shared general audience. We've got to do something around collaborating with them. I guess the other thing is that we really need to be mindful of is how many platforms can we actually support. Um, and all these platforms, you know, we've got the big ones like, you know, Te is a major investment, Digital New Zealand is a major investment, Cenotaph has been a major investment. How do we support those big platforms? And it really gets into that question that Peter Wall was raising. What do you take forward and what do you leave behind? And I think, you know, as a sector we have to make some quite tough decisions about that. Um, you know, two minutes left, right. I can talk for two minutes easily. Um, oh, and there's questions. Okay, right. Well, I better stop. That's probably where I'm going with it. Um, yeah, but that 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 taking things forward and, and leaving things behind. I think that's at a micro level and at a macro level. So it's platform based. It's also looking within your own content and deciding what is the stuff that needs to keep living. What's a historical reference? Um, getting those things right. And I better wrap up at that point and take any questions. I'm sorry for going over time. So hopefully by now you know the drill. If you do have a question, can you raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you? This one here. It's a catchy question. Hi. Um, so <laughs> I've built one of these platforms mm. in the past and I share a lot of the sort of uh, use topics to group things and stuff like that. Uh, my name's Walter. Hello. Um, one question, one thing that I've done that helps to make the authorship and the context available and public is to have a version history of any content that is added. So that sort of allows you to move forward with a piece of content, but be honest about its history. And how does that fit into what you envision? It does and it doesn't, I think. Uh, I think it's those, I guess the idea I'm trying to, trying to uh, get to is that there are universal subjects that carry on. You know, people, there'll always be an entry on Auckland, um, but will there always be an entry on digital media and the internet? Um, or do we need to be able to split those things in half? Um, we look at the people's entries, which when they're prepared, um, I think Middle Eastern groups are a very small proportion of society. And so they, I think, uh, correct, well, don't correct me if I'm wrong, but just let me make the point. Um, particular groups sort of were covered very briefly, you know, um, and, and you know, maybe a page of content. Um, a lot of those communities have, have expanded greatly in the last 10 years. So just having a version on that one piece of content that related to them probably doesn't do it justice. You actually need to split, split that out. Does that kind of make sense? It kind of makes sense. I think that my point is more about um, there is the ability to capture the metadata of how this thing came to be, how it was True. even deleted. Yep. Yep. Um, and, and its history alongside the actual content. Yep. Making yep. it available um, is one way of being honest with yep. um, True. and maintaining that legacy as yep. well. Yep. Yep. No, I certainly agree with that. And if you've got ways you can help us, we're all ears. <laughs> yeah. Oh, kia ora. Um, Philip Atoka from Museum Zaotearoa. I'm, I'm as putting aside slightly that that tiara and NZ history, which the questions there are more about who's the audience and what are you trying to keep current for now, but also the legacy issues. We've just worked with, and, and um, Tim Jones is here from Christchurch Art Gallery, with, with him and his team to digitise back copies of Agman's journals. And this is particularly for um, students, you know, museum study students and others who would be interested. So I'm quite interested in in 
MCH or other organisations who might play a role in looking after some of that digital heritage in ways where um, it's not clear who who's kind of responsible mm. for it. Mm. And maybe there is a role building on that discussion at NDF AGM this morning. Maybe there's a role for NDF to help to broker some of those kinds of discussions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think that sort of, um, well, we're coming to the end of the World War I commemoration program and we've already had people approaching us with their database that they thought was a good idea and they'd like someone to look after it. And you get into that sort of, it does become an organisational ego, well not ego, but does it fit our, does it fit what we're trying to achieve at the moment? No, we can't take that on. Um, maybe NDF can be brokering um, some of the sort of shared, you know, what is the shared vision that we're trying to achieve and does it fit into that and can we collaborate around that? And we're going to have to leave it at that. Yeah. So let's continue that conversation at the NDF stand at lunchtime. Um, so stay in here for how lessons learned in online journalism can help shape museum storytelling online. Otherwise, please thank Matthew and move to your next session. Thank you.